Good morning. I don't think we can fit anybody else in, so I think we might as well start right on time. Um, my name is Theron Dunn, and I'm very pleased to welcome you all to our seventh Nantucket Book Festival. Um, on behalf of the entire committee, we're very glad you're here. Um, thank you so much for coming year after year. We continue to present this festival because you continue to come. Otherwise, we would definitely not do it. Uh, very, <laughs> very special thanks are due to our premier sponsors, the White Elephant and the Nantucket Athenaeum, both of whom are well represented here today, um, and to our many sponsors and donors. And please do look at the back of your program because we value them all very much. Uh, they make it possible for most of our events here to be free and open to the members of our community and to our visitors. Uh, the the year-round work that our book festival does, our book foundation rather, does in the school and for the festival is only possible because of our friends who support us and who come to our events. Uh, after Claire Massoud and Alice Hoffman's presentation, they will be signing books which will be for sale uh, just right to my right. Please silence your cell phones now and we will tell you just a little bit about our next speakers. Claire Massoud is a woman of influence. She is a sought after teacher of creative writing. She is a noted critic of literary works, a winner of prestigious awards, and an author of beautifully crafted novels about people, often women, who find themselves dealing with matters of dire consequences in situations that are evocative of places that many of our, us find ourselves in. She tells her stories in a way that wakes us up with their brilliance and imagination. How did she come up with these ideas and yet somehow bring us back to feelings and experiences that we have had? Reading her latest novel, The Burning Girl, I found myself wishing that I had read it at the age of her characters, which is that of a young adult, and thinking, could this book be for young adults? And yet valuing it from the adult perspective, the age of a parent, thinking along with her child as, they, she, as these young women went through these experiences. It is a story so well told from the heads and hearts of young people that we're taken back to that time in our lives. That is the artfulness of a truly great storyteller. Few of you here in this hall need to be told who Alice Hoffman is. <laughs> um, familiar though she may be, one of our anchors of our festival as friend, advisor, and to our great benefit, frequent presenter here in this hall, it is well that we remember that Alice is not to be taken for granted, and we do not. <laughs> uh, her new novel, The Rules of Magic, is prequel to Practical Magic, one of the most loved of Alice's over 40 books. They include novels for adults, but also novels for young adults, books for children, nonfiction books. As you will see, Alice has abundant surprises for all of us. Sitting down for this conversation with Alice and Claire today is Kate Brosnan, another member of the festival family. She is our board member, our advisor, and Kate's real job is executive director and founder of the Nantucket Project, responsible for bringing some of the greatest thinkers of our time to Nantucket, as I'm sure many of you know. And now join me in welcoming Claire, Alice, and Kate. <laughs> Are these on? Hi, everyone. So it's so um, nice to be in this beautiful room with two of my favorite writers. Um, you know, I thought I would start because I, I, you know, I love this process of like going back and like I love both of these new books that you've written, but I also love this process of how to discover more about you, and I always find it in some quotes. Alice knows this. We did this last year. Um, Claire, your quote that I picked out is, um, and I think it's from your last book, life is about deciding what matters. It's about fantasy de that determines the reality. Have you ever asked yourself whether you'd rather fly or be invisible? I was like, mmm. <laughs> and, and maybe we'll start right there. 
Tell me about that quote, and, and would you rather fly or be invisible? Um, I'd rather fly. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I'd rather fly, but, but I think people have a pretty immediate... I mean, there are some people who say, Can I, can't I have both? <laughs> <laughs> that would be me. <laughs> right, but, 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 but if you have to choose just one, I think people really come down pretty quickly on one side or the other, and it, and it is, it is a, a matter of, of temperament, I think. You know, I, 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 from, from, as someone who would choose flying, I think of it as, I think of the flying thing as sort of a more childlike choice. And, and being invisible, which, which is about getting, which is about having the chance to have more knowledge mm. um, about everything and everyone, um, seems a, in some ways a more adult choice. That seems too scary to me. I wouldn't want that. Alice? It's so interesting because I immediately would choose being invisible. I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> I knew it. And the character that I'm writing about right now practices being invisible. Wow. But I don't think about it as finding out more information. I think about it as keeping more information to yourself. Hmm. Okay. Interesting. Interesting. Uh, all right. Now for Alice's quote. We're opposites. <laughs> this is, you know, this one, um, and because I think it goes to uh, especially this last book. I think love is a huge factor in fiction and in real life. Is there a risk? Always. In fiction and in life. Go ahead. Did I say that? <laughs> <laughs> yes, you did. Yeah. Alice Hoffman. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I agree with myself. <laughs> I do. Yeah. And you take that risk. It really, in, and so now we're going to talk about the books. I'll start with you. Alice, in this latest prequel, which is, first of all, why did you go back to the story of the Owens family? Because I found that 10 years later, by the way. 20. Was it 20? You know, I think, Whoa. I know, I think, well, I had readers that were constantly saying, you know, what happens next, you know, and I started to think about that, but I really wanted to know what happened in the past. I'm much, always much more interested in the, what happened in the past than what will happen. Right. Um, so, and also I wanted to write about the 60s, which is my favorite time period and the period I lived through, <laughs> and I just felt like, you know, the idea that you can never know older people, including your parents, really, because you don't know the way they were when they were young. You know, your, your children can't know you because they don't know you the way you were when you were young. They think this is who you are. Right. But they're wrong. Right. <laughs> they are so wrong. <laughs> so wrong. And Claire, that goes to your um, book also in th this new book, The Burning Girl, about this interior life of these two um, to young girls, but also that this time in adolescence is a lot like romantic love. Yeah, I mean, I, I actually think that, that there's, there's, childhood friendships can be like romantic love too. I mean, if, in my mind, I think of it as the sort of, the coming of boundaries into life and that in childhood, you don't have the same kind of boundaries. You, you, kids play like puppies in a pen and, and they don't think about where one ends and the other begins. And, and then adolescence is, is, is that time in which you sort of pause and look up and look around and you're like, oh, you know, th there's a world out there. Um, or you go, to, you, know, you go to your friend's house and, it's, and you think, well, this is weird. So either my house is weird or this house is weird. Like, which is, <laughs> what's a normal house? Right. And, and you, st you try to put yourself in the context of a broader thing. And that, and that that comes in the way of these passionate friendships because, you, because, you, because you're having to sort of set boundaries. And not, every, not everybody always wants to set a, set a boundary, you know? Right. Yeah, but, but certainly I do think it is like first love. Yeah. Yeah. It, and when I was reading it, it reminded me of those, the intensity of the relationships at that point where we're learning everything about how to be who we are, right? I mean, through, through our parents, but mostly through our friendships, and then we can get to be who we really are in those intimate right. early friendships. Um, there's also this the idea of spirit and ghosts, Alice, and um, which is a theme through a lot of your work, and that you, I was reading, and we talked about this a little bit last night, that I was reading that you had an experience in London where you heard voices out in the hallway fighting every night, same fight, and then they were gone, and you felt that that was definitely a spirit experience. 
I and maybe. I believe you. <laughs> I believe it. Yeah, I don't know. It felt like that to me. It was a really crummy hotel. And there was no, there, the door didn't have one of those latches that you could look through. But I did hear the same, it was where they stuck the writers when they came to London. <laughs> and um, I did hear the same thing over and over again. And I wrote a book called The Third Angel, which goes, which you can read either back in time or forward. So Ooh. you can read it either from the beginning to the end or the end to the beginning. That must have been really hard to write. It was really fun to do because it made me feel like how fluid time is and how we're so affected by the past. I mean, you always feel, well, sitting in this room, but you always feel like the past is kind of with you. You know, you sit down and like all these other experiences are sitting down with you, everything your mother told you and your grandmother told you and the stories that you heard about, you know, relatives. You know, you're carrying all those ghosts with you. Right. And I love that because somebody had asked you in one of these things I was reading, do you believe in ghosts? And you said, we all have them. It's our, our past that we drag with us through our lives. I think that made so much sense to me. Um, May I? It just reminds me. I learned recently about um, epigenetics. Do you all know about that? About no. the fact that they discovered that um, it isn't just our memories, it's the memories of... So, so they train. It was about mice and fear. They made um, they 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 made an association between the scent of cherry blossoms and and fear for mice. And three generations later, the mice oh. were were still afraid of the scent of cherry blossoms. So, so I, I feel as though it, we we do. I mean, it may our or may not be ghosts. Our bodies and ourselves that, contain the yeah, memory of, Absolutely. That, that predate our lives. And yeah. the only thing worse than being a mouse is being a Russian Jew. <laughs> <laughs> for generations. <laughs> um, oh, I knew this was going to be so much fun. I knew it. I did. I knew it. I knew it. Um, you grew up very much in the world of fairy tale, and um, your grandmother's stories really had an impact on you. And talk to me a little bit about who she was and how she impacted your life. Yeah, she was like the one person in my life that I could really depend on. I had a, a family that you couldn't depend on anybody, and they weren't really there. But she was really there, and it was just so interesting to be with her, you know, be on a bus with her in New York City and have her tell stories about her childhood in Russia. So I feel, always felt like I was in two places at once, you know? Right. And, you know, like a, a literary place and a real place. And I still feel that way, you know? So. I just felt and at that age, Alice, did you, was that the beginning, the seeds of, I, I want to be a storyteller, I want to write this down? I think then I was just, I want to hear more. Okay. You know? Right, right, right. And, and Claire, I think the interesting part of your ghosts um, are that you're really the only American in your family. I, I am, yeah. Well, no, now I have kids. <laughs> oh, okay. Oh, that's right. They're Americans, But your family of origin. Yes. Talk a little bit about Australia and your parents and, and moving and, and how that impacted you. Yeah, so so my, um, my mom was Canadian and my father was French, which makes everybody think, that I'm French Canadian, but <laughs> but I'm not. She was she was from Toronto, so um, and and we moved around a lot when when I was a kid. And my sister, who's older, was born in France, so I was the only one born in the United States. And um, and we we lived in Australia and Canada. I was born here, but then we moved briefly to Canada, then to Australia, then back to Canada, then here when I uh, when I was a teenager. And um, and and I do think. Um, you know, there are all sorts of ways in which I think that made me interested in, in writing and in, in being story, telling stories. And part of it was having control over something, right? Like you had this imaginary world that was yours. I remember hearing, this is many years ago, I was in Paris and I was, I was young, and Edmund White and Kathy Acker were having a conversation. And Edmund White said, he, he lived in Paris at the time, and he said, I love living in Paris because I feel that English is all mine. I feel like it's my language and I can do what I want with it. And then Kathy Acker said, and I feel exactly the same way. And I thought to myself, you live in London. But anyway, <laughs> but, but maybe, you know, she meant American English is all mine. Um, but, but I think part of it is, is that thing of feeling that, that, um, that something is, is yours and your imaginary world is yours. Yeah. Right. Let's talk about a little bit about the characters in, in your new books. Um, Alice, Franny, Jet, and Vincent. I actually find Vincent fascinating. Um, yeah, he. Why he's, did you make that face? Yeah, you didn't. You didn't like Vincent. No, I did, but I don't know how much I can say about him because he's kind of a surprise when you read the book. 
So oh, so I, I we don't. Feel, who's I read feel, the book? <laughs> who's read the book? You're gonna Who be hasn't good? read the? Oh my God! So we can't blow the uh, surprise. So I, there's something that you know. He sometimes this happens is that and I'm sure Claire has happened to you. You're writing a character. You think you know everything about them, but you don't. And Vincent didn't know something about himself, and I didn't know something, and it came as a huge surprise to me. So, so it's hard for me to talk about him. Okay. Okay. <laughs> We'll talk about it later. Okay. Um, it, to me, the over the theme that kept coming through um, in um, in your latest book was, you know, and Vincent symbolizes this is is the only way to live really is to be your true self, right? right. The, the, it's the only thing you can be, and Vincent's a great example of that. But but so are the sisters, and this idea in Alice's book that you know if you if you love something bad will happen. Yeah. You know, this curse that's on the family, that something bad's gonna happen. Right. Um, and you know, that's true. <laughs> really, it is true. I, because... I agree. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, in a larger sense than, than our own experiences, um, if you love someone, you can lose them. I mean, it makes love, you vulnerable. It makes you vulnerable. And, and not only can you, you can lose them, you will lose them. You will either die or they will die. You will lose them. And, and that's just the way life is. So, so loving s someone is just a huge, um, a huge step off of a cliff, really, you know? Right, it, right. And yet we're so willing to take it. So are your characters at the cost. And, you know, I would say the, the risk is worth it. Yeah, I mean, I think there's nothing, there really is nothing else. That's right. What's the point of being human and being right. alive if, you, if, if, if right. you can't love? Yeah, I just wish some of those guys didn't have to die, Alice. There were some good guys there in that book. They died? Yeah. <laughs> really, I don't remember that. Wait, wait. When the, what? Some, sometime, fairly early on also, so like maybe it's not a spoiler to say some of them die fairly, like one of them at least. Right. Yeah. <laughs> well, people die, Kate. <laughs> There's nothing I can do okay. about that. Let's not get too heavy. Okay. Um, <laughs> Let's talk about Julia and Cassie. Okay, first question is, who are you more like? Oh, I think I'm more like Julia. I mean, oh. I, I, you know, I, th I, I think, so d just, there, there's, Julia's the storyteller, right? And Cassie's the one whose story is, I mean, is, is the, to is, and, I, and, I, and I think I've, al I've always thought about it, that in terms of novels like Brideshead Revisited, you know, there's Charles Ryder and Sebastian Flight and um, you We're know, back but, to flying. but 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 also um, Gatsby. You know, right. that, like I, I feel as though the the, the the person whose story gets told tends to be the the um, the act, acting. You know, the one who who has a more a more vivid acting life as opposed to a reflective um, observing life. And um, you know, the downside of being the reflective observing one is it's just not as much fun as being the other, or dark though, you know, the tragedy also goes to the, the actor, but, but on the other side, you get to, you get to tell a story. And I, in, in the book, they, they, dis, they go and discover an abandoned um, hospital, or it was at one point a hospital for women, yeah. which was really interesting. And I felt like that was so symbolic of like the untold stories, the hushing up, um, and they break into it. And uh, so talk to me about it a little bit. Cause Alice, do you remember on Long Island, Pilgrim State? Oh, God. And, and that th there's this huge building that had been shut down. And it always gave me, just even driving by it, had a power to it. Yeah. yeah. So and this is what reminded me in Claire's book. Talk about those untold, <laughs> the, the, the quiet woman that just doesn't doesn't have a voice. It feel, I felt like that was really symbolic. Right. Well, in my in my mind, it's it, you know, it's it's a, it's an asylum that they happen upon, and I was uh, you know, thinking about the d double meaning of that, right? That it's both the place you shut people away, and it's the place of refuge at the same time. I um, mean, you don't really know, right? It's, right. it's like it's like love. It's the gamble. Like, which is it going to end up being? Um, and and I and I. Um, yeah, I, th I think the the it, it's almost the ghost the question of ghosts again. I, I the, my interest I became sort of obsessed with places like that. We spent a year in Germany in Berlin and in, in and around Berlin there are lots of abandoned, very haunted places, including a, a mental uh, institution in a place called Baylet, south of Berlin. That's an entire sort of uh, compound. Uh, 
that, that had its own serial killer, actually, at one time. Um, yeah. There's um, a book. <laughs> and, and, but but, but in, in Germany, you can just wander right in. There's no sort of, there's no barbed wire and no, like, you know, tras trespassers will be prosecuted. But Massachusetts is full of those places, too. And I feel like there's so much... Um, yeah, I mean, I just it, it, there's so much when you walk through such a place or walk by such a place, like you really do feel the ghosts there, and and um, and and there are so many stories un, untold that were never right. told. Right. Yeah, and you wonder what they are, right? Right. You, you describe this this book um, as a children's book for grown-ups. Mm -hmm. Tell me more about that. Well, I, I, so, so um, one of the things that, it, then everybody says, like, you mean a YA book? And, no, I don't, actually. I mean, a, like a kid's book for grown-ups. So our kids are teenagers now, and, um, but, but, but I read to them for a long time, particularly our son, who's, who's not um, a huge reader himself, but loved being read to. And, and it brought back for me the, 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 that great way as a, as when you're reading either as being a kid or reading like a kid, you, you fall into the story, right? You just fall into it. And, and I have that experience with, with these books, right? With Alice's books, um, that, that you, you don't ask the question, is this, is this plausible? Like if you think about a Greek myth, right? You don't think, um, wait a minute. Um, so Zeus falls in love with a maiden, Hera jealous turns the maiden into a cow. You're like, wait a minute. People don't turn into cows. I'm not going to read this. Forget about it. No, you just you're like, oh my God, she turned into a cow. What next, right? And 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 and, and, and there's something really um, fabulous about that. And and that I think, um, you know, that's the magic of, of of we were talking last night about abracadabra. You know, the oh, words. Right. Tell me again. The words. I create what I. I speak. create what I speak. I create what I speak. And, and it was, I think it was that feeling that I was, that I, um, that's what I was hoping. Like I, another way I've said it, I, I, want, I wanted the experience of reading it to be like a slide, sort of slippery, right. you know, like so that you're not, you're not stopping and trying to Find analyze. Find out where you are yeah, in it, Yeah, analyze right. things. You're just kind of going. You just with go it. with it. Yeah. Magic, Alice, and fantasy, big part of a lot of your writing. Why? Well, I, I feel like it's the original literature. Okay. So I feel like for me, it's not a leap. For me, the original literature is folk tales, fairy tales, um, myths, and you know the stories that grandmothers told to grandchildren. And they're always kind of not always, but they're often cautionary tales. They're a kind of a teaching mechanism to teach you about the world in a very emotional, basic state. You know what about right and wrong? Uh, for me, magic and literature always went together. I mean, that's what I read as a kid. I don't. I think. You know, realism is kind of a newer variety of writing and storytelling. And I think, you know, the original storytelling always included magic. And I think what Claire said was so interesting about, you know, creating a world, and that's what storytellers do. You know, we want to create a world for you to go into and fall down, kind of fall down the rabbit hole and just, you know, believe in this world and, and accept it and be part of it. Because as the as the reader, you're creating it too. We were talking about that right. last night, right? You create the world that you're reading. Right. And it's an interesting relationship that I don't think any other art form has, where you're doing this together, really. I mean, my Heathcliff might not be your Heathcliff, yeah. but right. he's why the, the movie always disappoints. Right, right. exactly, <laughs> always, always. Um, Alice, you consider yourself, I think, and, um, you're a writer, but you're more, you think of yourself as a reader? Is that, I mean, do you, you know, I used to, but not anymore. Oh, that changed? It changed for me because I- the 40 books plus, it kind it's, of changes. It's, it changed <laughs> because, and I feel really bad because I was such a voracious reader, but now I feel like I have to make a choice. And especially being on a computer all day and with eyes that are getting older, I, I can't then sit down and read a gigantic book. So I have to make a choice between my own work and, and someone else's book. And so it has to be, it has to get me on the first page or I'm, you know, I, I just feel like otherwise I could be writing. And Alice, in, in your situation, do you feel like a lot of pressure? Because it seems like you churn things out. I mean, is there a sense of pressure that you've put on yourself that is, is it the flow of how you would choose or is, does it feel like 
as many of us feel like in our jobs that we, we have to. It's, compli it's complicated for me, but <clears throat> I, I do feel pressured, but I've always felt pressured. I mean, I felt pressured to you know, finish high school in three years, right. finish college in three years, finish graduate school. I feel pressured. I, I feel like there's not enough time. Okay. And I think I'm right. There's not <laughs> enough time. Here we go again. <laughs> uh, sorry, <laughs> I know. I'm yeah. So I feel like I'll never be able to write all the books. So I've, I've now, at this point, realized that, okay, so I'm never going to be able to write all the books. Right, right. Do you, how about you, Claire? In, 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 is, it, is it a joyful experience? Is it a laboring experience? Is it? It's sort of both. I mean, okay. I, yeah, I, I think, um, I, you know, these days I teach quite a bit. I teach full time in the, in the school year. And, and, um, and so I, I spend a lot of time lamenting the fact that I don't have time to write. Um, but, but in a funny way, that means that when I do have time, it, it, it feels all the more, you know, for one thing, you don't procrastinate as much, right? But right. <laughs> um, for, for another, it, it, feels, it feels more joyful in a way. Uh, you know, I, I think, um, I know what you mean about there's never, there's never gonna be enough time. And I, and, I, and, I, and I feel that not just in writing, but in a life way now, which I didn't used to, which I, when I think about what would I like back from my youth, what I would like is that feeling just that feeling that there's lots of time. Right. Just that feeling that you know you could lie in a field for an, and stare at the sky for the afternoon, and and that's there's there, you're not you're not. It's not falling, a waste of time. Yeah, you're, and you're not falling behind on anything right. else, right? Like I, I I don't know if I am yeah. I going to get that in a little bit. I hope. Am I going to get that again? I'm hoping sometime. But right. you know, but life is so busy too now in a different way. You know, when you're saying about the computer screens, I feel like we just don't need to turn them off, right? Like that alone would slow everything down if you just didn't look at the email for five days. And you don't. You write with a, a pad and a pen. I do. Yeah. Not on the computer. No, I, I was a temporary secretary in my youth, and I type really fast. And you know, on the computer, it looks pretty good. Right. <laughs> it's a bad idea. <laughs> how important is the editing process, and how involved? Like, I mean, is it a constant rewrite, or is it something that okay, you get the bones down and then go back to, or have other eyes on it? Because I, I think editing would be here. You have what do you take out? For me, it's constant. I'm constantly editing. Put, can you put your mic up? Oh, I'm sorry. I thought I was Thank just you. talking to you, Kate. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. There's a couple other people. Oh, in the sorry. Room. Excuse me. <laughs> um, I'm constantly editing all the time, but I try to do it so that I don't do it too soon. Because if I do it too soon, I tend to just throw out the whole project. You know, so right. So you don't want to look at it and think, oh, this is horrible. After five pages, after 50 pages, you're kind of more like, okay, well, this is fixable. Okay maybe, and so I do a lot of editing, and then I have friends look at it, and then I have an agent look at it, and I'm just constantly editing. And it's, it's hard, because I think a lot of it has to do with cutting your own work. I, I, you know, for me, the rules of magic, I would say from the original manuscript, maybe 100 pages Got exists. Cut. Yeah. Oh, that, that exi exists. Exists. Okay. Yeah. And I understand, Claire, that you gave your book to your daughter to read. Yeah, this one, not everyone, poor okay. thing, yes. <laughs> but this one I did give her the manuscript. She's a teenager, she's now, she's almost 17, and, um, and, and I, there were just, it, it, there were just things, because it's about adolescence now, you know, and, and there were things I wanted, and she did, she said, Mm, I would never use that word. I would never yeah. say that to a friend, you know. And she, um, and she, you took it, her I advice. I took her. I t absolutely took her advice. And 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 <clears throat> it did mean, you know, when people said, "I don't believe that any uh, teenager would," uh, you know, I I did. So I said to her, "If you think there's anything that's implausible or that somebody wouldn't think or that you know, tell me." And and so I, you know, and I made changes. And so when people say, "What does Bissud at, you know, fifty know about teenage life?" I'm like, well. I know some, you know, and I had I had an I had an authentic advisor. Right. <laughs> and do you think in in that that it is different, or how how similar it is it, no matter what generation is? Because it seems to me those are universal feelings of coming of age, right? It doesn't change that much. Yeah, that was my that was my feeling was that the the the, the emotions are the same. The emo right. It's like you know the emotions haven't and the intensity of the friendship. Just you know, the, um, did I mention last night? There's a, there's a um, 
Lori Moore has just published a book of essays and, and, and it, criticism, and in that book, she's, she's reviewing a book about adolescence, and she closes the review by saying, adolescence is a howling dog. Eventually, it is buried, but it is buried alive, which is so, so and, and I feel like it's so true. Ooh. It's so true. And, and I feel like the, the, watching, my, watching my daughter and my niece go through that time, I feel like my howling dog came, <laughs> came back to, you know, came out of the ground. And, and it seemed so immediate and so recent and so powerful, those, those, the intensity of that emotion and uh, of all those emotions. And so, yeah, I don't think that stuff changes. But, 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 but there are, you know, practically speaking, there are a lot, kids are worldlier in right. all sorts of ways now, much earlier you know, things that, things that they know without knowing, you know, they, they know, they know things that we, you know, didn't know. Didn't know. And in, in your book too, I, it was seemed to me, so thinking about, and I, I think that you can't help but going back to those relationships in your own, and when they were over, they were over. Like, you know, as adults, you, you know, you, you might, ease back from relationships, but in you, almost like you have the courage in a way to say, okay, this is done. done. You are dead to me. I know, I know, I know. I w you know what I mean? It's so intense and so... Wendy Levitt, I know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, and, then, and also and how they go in di different directions because unfortunately I was more like Cassie. So I had a lot of empathy for her. And I, I have a feeling, for me, it's like growing up with three brothers. You, you, know, you had to be a risk taker. You had to, you had to be tough and hang out and, and go and, and not be shy and right. all of those things. So, so I was always rooting for Cassie. Um, but I had friends, right, that, that, that after a while, it's almost like, and the parents say, well, you know, that one's a wild one. Right. You know? <laughs> She's I, trouble. Right, she, yeah, she's trouble. I would rather you didn't sleep over her house. <laughs> you know? I don't know if there'll be any grown-ups there. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, if, you, if you weren't, and I think I've asked this of you before, I want to see if it's changed, Alice. If you weren't a writer, what would you be? Uh, I don't know. That's such a different life. So pick it. But I'd be managed. I'd be the manager of whatever it was. <laughs> you would still be the boss lady. Yeah, because I think I creating the world. You know, you're kind of the boss as a novelist. Right. You create the world. I mean, eventually, you know, an editor might tell you something, but basically, you're in charge of things, and um, and you like that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah I, you know, I think that I have a friend who's a filmmaker. And um, it seems this wonderful, but it's like, it's, for one thing, it's like getting a, the Hindenburg off the ground. And, f and, and for another, everybody feels like they have a say. They're like, I'm giving you a million dollars. Let me tell you what you're going to do. Right. Or I'm starring in your movie. Let me tell you what I'm going to do. You know? And, and I feel like being a writer, you just, it's yours. Yeah. I mean, obviously, they're editors, and, you know, I know. Yeah. But no, I mean, I was a screenwriter for 25 years in Hollywood, and I work for those people who told me what to do. Yeah. At one point, I, this is so horrible, don't tell anybody this, but. Um, <laughs> All right, everyone, it's a secret. I worked for Cher for many years, and I was getting notes from her boyfriend, who was like the pizza guy. <laughs> do you remember that? You remember Rob Camaletti was giving me notes, and it, I took them, <laughs> you know? From the what pizza could I do? guy? Sure. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they weren't that bad, actually. <laughs> Um, I want to know what got, you got from the pizza guy, but we can talk about that later. Claire, you're a teacher as well. Can you teach writing? Of course not. Okay. <laughs> but, but, but you can teach reading. You okay. really can teach reading. And I think, you know, as a teacher, what I, what I try to, um, for one thing, we read a bunch of, you know, published writers as part of the class, but, but, but it's also, um, in what, what I'm trying to, um, what, what I'm trying to teach the students to do in terms of criticism um, or, or like critiques of their fellow students' work is really just to say to the writer what's on the page. Because I think one of the things that, that, is, that can be hard when you write, so you have a vision in your head, and then there's a funnel from that vision onto the page, right? And, and you might have some idea that pretty much everything in your head is on the page, not always so, right? And, 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 I, and I think that for, 
for people who are starting out writing, the most useful thing you can give them is not like, I like this, or I don't like this, or I think this is great. Like, that's not that helpful. But just to say what's there. And then they say, you so, so that you, there are conversations where one student will say, you know, and that at the end when the, when, the, when the old lady dies and somebody else says, the old lady died? I didn't think the old lady was dead, right? <laughs> and that's actually really useful for the writer to hear. That's right. more useful than I loved it. Right. And do you ever use your books or? Do, uh, no, I wouldn't think so. <laughs> I was just going, how bold is she? Would she, yeah. Um. I, I, I think that it, it's so interesting because I think that the, the characters, obviously women writers write really strong characters. Um, the woman upstairs, you're, I haven't read it, but I'm dying to because I love what she wanted to have on her tombstone. What was that? Um, F you all, I think, was yeah. it? <laughs> I thought that was so good. <laughs> right? Like, you know, great mother, great daughter, great this, and hers was F you all. <laughs> I just thought that was, yeah. Because she felt that her voice, because people assume that she hadn't had a life, and then she had that fantasy relationship with someone, and she yeah. felt misunderstood. Well, I, I, I just, I think one of the things, I, when I was working on that novel, which is about a, um, it's about an elementary school teacher who always wanted to be an artist, and she always wanted to have kids. So she's a teacher, so she has kids in a way, and she makes art at home, but then she befriends a woman who's like getting on in the art world and is, is sort of recognized as an artist, and it's about, you know, all of the emotions um, around that. And, and the first time, I, when I was still working on it, I read it at a, um, at a we, I, we were doing a year in Germany that I mentioned before, and I read it there. And, and this guy came up to me afterwards, a, a sort of quite um, austere Dutchman, you know, older Dutchman, and he said, you know, thank you for reading, it was this sort of ranty bit at the beginning of the book, and he said, thank you for reading that. He said, my, um, it reminded me so much of my youth. When I was a kid, on Saturdays, our family would have breakfast, and then my brothers and my father and I would say, and my mother would go upstairs and clean the upstairs while we stayed in the kitchen, and we would hear her swearing at the top of her lungs <laughs> as she was, you know, she would just hear her shouting, and then she'd come down smiling, and we'd never speak about it. <laughs> Right, and I, and I actually think that's, that's, you know, that's the, I remember my mother yelling at the laundry, right? Like, right. I, I think that women's anger, that sense, um, you know, hopefully less now, but, but, but historically, women, women weren't supposed to be angry, and they had a lot to be angry about. Right. So, so they're, 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 how are you gonna, how are you gonna let it come out? And, and, and the untold stories, I mean, Th those, those, that was not part of any kind of public narrative. And it was interesting um, for me, the reception um, of that book, that there were people who came up and said, I love that book and it really spoke to me. And then there were people who said, I hate that book. Why did you write that terrible character? She's, she's, no, she's no example to anyone, you know. And, <laughs> Then you know it's good. Yeah. <laughs> but it was really, but it was really interesting. I feel like, you know, it was. I felt like it was actually a sort of moratorium on, or is that what I mean, on, on women's anger. Like it was a, you know, like. And didn't your own mother was she in law school and she did she had yes yeah, she had and to, she gave it up. She gave it up yeah. and resented that. She did. Yeah. She did. Yeah. She was she was of an age. I think this, you know, um, she was born in in thirty three. And um, she was of an age to be just a little too old for, um, you know, I mean, I guess if she'd been, she was a little younger than Betty Friedan, but she was older than Jermaine Greer. Like, right. I mean, you know, so, so, so she was just a little too old for it to be easy. And, and when, well, that said, my parents' first date, they met at a summer school at Oxford, and their first date was a double date with Gloria Steinem and her date. Yeah. Wow. And, I, and I always said, Mom, you should write to, she, she wouldn't remember me. Um, <laughs> but, um, but, 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 so they, that's the generation, that was her generation. But I, but I, um, but I think that, you know, she was sort of, she bought into the whole thing and she would have had to chuck it all over. And she, you know, it was just a hard, I think if you were born 10 years later, it was just a yeah, lot easier. Yeah, a whole different life, yeah. a whole different life. Um, I think we're gonna open it up. Do we have time to open? Five. We have five, um, because I could do this. We could be here for, you know, next, till next Saturday. Um, does anybody have any questions for, sure. Well, I 
have to say that I've always hated to be read to. So, oh, so uh, what, what, what do both Claire and Alice feel about e-books, books on tape, um, and as opposed to the physical book? Yeah. So I've never listened to a book on tape. I've, I've listened to one of mine once because Judith Light, who's a friend, was reading it, and she's so great. I wanted to hear her, but I, and I don't, I don't read um, e-books because I have nothing against them for other people, but I, it, I, it seems like I'm on a computer. I, why, why would I want to do that? I want to be with a book in bed, or you know, it just seems. I, I've, I, I personally have no interest in it, but I think it's great if you're traveling or whatever. I, but it's not for me. Um, I, I sort of do like being read to, but I've, it's a different experience than reading it yourself. But I, but I, I also, I'm, I'm big at the moment into the an, that we're animals. And as animals, um, sensual things are really important um, to us. And, and I, feel, I worry that we're not imparting that to our kids. And, and when I was young, I didn't just love reading books. I loved the paper. Mm. I remember I, I, loved, I loved the end papers, the, the typeface, the... That, right. And when I yeah the smell like when I was a kid, when I had my one of my first books and I and I remember saying could I have deckle edges on the and being like yeah. so excited they're like sure you can have that I was like oh you know and, 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 and I'm like you're just not gonna get that with it with a Kindle or a book yeah. anybody else question. I think yesterday. <laughs> Did I become my grandmother? Well, I love that image. Thank you. It's a beautiful image. I, you know, maybe it's true. I hope it's true. That that sounds great. I mean, I feel like I could never, you know, I could never be like her. I wish I could be like her. Um, she was just so incredibly real and fierce. Um, so I, I don't feel like I could ever be like her, but thank you if, if you think I am. <laughs> so um, I just got a text message from my daughter, who's a huge fan of yours. She should be your fan as well. She, she, will she, she will be. She will be. Yeah, she will just be. get her the book. She says, holy expletives. Ask her how she achieved the haunting atmosphere and what inspired her to write Blackbird House. And the magic. Also, I'd like to know her writing process. <laughs> <laughs> She's so cute. Do you listen to music? Set to What happens? Ask her how she does character development. She's a riot. She's hardcore, okay? Does she have any plans to write about more spells or witches? Wow. wow. Well, that's a lot. That was like a five part. You better exchange emails. Yeah, I, I think I better meet her. Um, well, I can't even remember how to begin with this, but um, uh, I really appreciate that, that email from her or text or whatever it is. You're really lucky to have a daughter who's also a reader. Yeah. That is kind of like the biggest um, hole in my life that I never had a daughter. Because for me and my mother, like even when we weren't talking, we shared the same books. And uh, we didn't talk a lot, but we also read a lot. And um, just in terms of a Blackbird House, I had a house on Cape Cod that was haunted. And you know, they, they didn't even show it to anybody because it was so haunted, but what the hell? You know, I looked at it, we bought it. Um, <laughs> and so it's kind of the story I love Link's short stories, and it's you know the story of the house over 300 years. You know, in terms of atmosphere and how you create an atmosphere, it's really hard to describe that because it's kind of magic. You know, you just kind of let yourself go and see what comes through you and what happens. Anyway, thank you to her. We've been so lucky to get to spend time with the two of you. This has been delightful and a real thrill for me. So. Thank and you. thank you, Kate. Thank you.